All right, Johnny. Yeah. We are going to revisit one of our top downloaded podcast episodes ever in 15 years. Yes. And it's certainly one of my favorite topics. And we have been talking about this, well, in, in our all through our history, because it is that powerful, it changes the way you view human interactions. And how people view you. Yes. This is really important. So before we dive in, if any of these symptoms sound like how you're experiencing the world or relationships or some of the obstacles you're facing, then you might want to get a notepad and take notes because this is one of the most popular lectures in our X Factor Accelerator, and it is life-changing, paradigm shifting. We're going to be talking about low-value behaviors. Now, low-value behaviors are mindsets that become actions that ultimately repel high value people from your life. And we're going to define low and high value in a minute. But if you find yourself constantly chasing others to hang out, to go on dates with you, to spend time with you, if you find yourself constantly being stuck with the bar tab, not getting the Venmo requests filled, chasing people's attention, approval, acceptance, money, just to get them to spend time with you. And if it feels like building relationships is a lot of work for you, like tons of effort and energy, odds are you might be exhibiting some of these behaviors that we're going to cover here today. And just to add to that is that it is okay that you exhibit these behaviors because you're now acknowledging that you have them. The first step to change these behaviors is to identify them in yourself. We wouldn't be up here discussing this if we didn't already go through this ourselves. In fact, it's one of the reasons that I got involved in self-development. It allowed me to recognize that I wasn't perfect, that I had a lot of room to grow, and these behaviors I needed to fix if I was going to, and I can even use the word manifest in this case, because... When you do correct these behaviors, the opportunities come to you. But while you're exhibiting these behaviors, these opportunities get pushed from you. You repel these opportunities. And the, and the other part that goes with this is just because you have identified them doesn't mean that you get rid of them. Because what we're going to be discussing is that your true nature comes out when you're under tension and pressure. When you're under tension and pressure, you're reduced to the level of your training. You're reduced to the things that you always do. You'll go to where you're most comfortable. So anyone can listen to this podcast and go, oh, I, I hear you. everything you guys are saying. That's why I don't do any of that. Well, anyone can say that sitting on the couch listening to this podcast, but when you're in front of the guy that you're supposed to make a pitch to, when you're talking to your boss who is about to either say yes or no to that raise you're asking about, when you're on a date with, with somebody that you're incredibly interested in, there is tension and pressure on those situations. And this is why you get awkward, you get clumsy, you get tongue-tied. You're not high value in those moments. You're reduced to the level of your training. And this is why we go through such efforts in our live programs to, to do video work, to show you, to diagnose these behaviors so that you can begin the work that happens immediately. And this is the best part though. You don't need to spend years in fixing them. Self-development is an endless journey, but the minute you identify them, the minute you start making changes, you begin to see people treating you differently. And that gives you the strength to continue doing it and continue strengthening what you're going to begin with at this moment. Now, many of you listening have not had training. No. I didn't have training, at least I thought, until I realized that actually your training starts when you're a child. Your parents and your family and those who raised you were conditioning you with certain behavior patterns. And as we go through these behavior patterns and lay out what we consider low value behaviors, these are all ways that we are chasing attention, approval, and acceptance. How are we getting that attention from our parents is typically the first place it starts. As a child, you're crying, you're screaming, you're yelling, you're arguing. 
these patterns to communication and how you get that value from your parents, get that attention, get that appreciation, get that approval and acceptance, well, that's modeled very early on in life. And I didn't realize it. And there are certain environments where these patterns will show up more than others. Johnny pointed out a few of them. First date for some of you, a boardroom for some of you, pitching a potential client with a massive deal on the line for some of you, in a sales call environment where you really need to make that quota. These are moments where you need something so badly from someone else that you will fall into these patterns that were woven into your life as a child. Now, for me, in going through this experience of self-development, the first place that I recognized it 15 years ago when we started the show was around women that I was most attracted to, women that I gave all the value to, women that I wanted to win over, that I wanted their attention, their appreciation, their acceptance to go on that date with me. And I searched high and low for the perfect things to say, the perfect witty one-liner. I practiced my humor and my banter and when to touch and how to stand but I was still exhibiting these behaviors under all of those strategies. So if you find yourself in a loop chasing another podcast episode, another YouTube video, just reading one more self-development book to get the result that you're after, we just ask that you take a new lens and look at the behavior that you're exhibiting, not the strategy, the tactic, the cheat, the hack, but what are the underlying behaviors and the patterns to your communication in chasing someone else's attention, approval, and acceptance? I want to add to that that regardless of what your career is and what you're uh, doing on, on a day-to-day -day for your nine-to-five or whatever it is that you put food on the table, it is important to understand that your action behaviors affect everybody else. And if you're acting in a high value manner, you're going to be seen as a high value person, which means that people are going to be attracted to you. They're going to take interest in you. They're going to want things from you. They're going to want to be around you because you give value. Now, the other side of that is when you're listening to this, you might think, well, I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm not pitching meetings. I, I'm happily married. Regardless of that, you, your actions and behaviors still affect people. And so if you're acting in a low value manner, you are pushing people away. So we discussed on this show about weak ties and how weak ties are how people network to get things done in their lives. So if Joe, a friend of yours, is looking for somebody that can help him out with a specific situation, if you're acting in a high value manner, Bill, who's the connection between you and his buddy, is going to think of you first. Why? Because you're top of mind. You're a high value guy. He can trust you. He's going to make that connection. So when you act in this manner, this is how you're, you're attracting these opportunities. And when you're acting in a low value manner, well, your name's not going to pop up in the mental Rolodex. In fact, your name will be far from it. And because of that, when you understand that someone who's high value, someone who is cooperative, someone who is not chasing attention, approval, acceptance from others, but instead giving it, what ends up happening is you attract other high value people. Low value behaviors actually attract toxic, narcissistic, abusive people. So if you find yourself constantly surrounded by people who are tearing you down, who are taking from you, who are cheating on you, who are just general toxic people, it's not just that hey, you got to remove the toxic people in your life. It's also an opportunity for you to look inward to the patterns of communication and behavior that you're exhibiting that is the beacon, that light that is allowing these people to stay in your life. And many times during our X Factor program, when we're talking to clients who have this realization, this light bulb goes off around an instance of low value behavior, an environment that evokes low value behavior in themselves that shift happens rapidly where you now are able to draw a boundary. 
So last month we had on Nedra, we were talking about drawing boundaries. We were, we've talked a lot on the show about removing toxic people from our life. What happens is low value people are easily pushed around, swayed, maneuvered, taken advantage of. You struggle to draw boundaries as a low value person because you are not sure where you're going to get that attention from if you lose this person in your life. So we will have clients have this light bulb go off and go, wow, I thought this person was my best friend, but in actuality, I was enabling them. I didn't draw a boundary. Or wow, this family member was emotionally abusive and I was putting up with it because I needed that attention. I needed that appreciation. I needed that acceptance. So it's such a profound shift. This is why we want to start with this perspective first, because this will change the way every other tip, strategy, tactic you've learned from our toolbox episodes over the last 15 years actually gets results in your life. All right, so are we ready to start this? Because we did a lot of talking there, and I wanted to start to get into the meat so that everyone could have some fun with this. Because the idea on its, on its face value is really exciting. But when we start getting into the meat of this, some of you are going to start getting a little bit uncomfortable because... Well, some of these behaviors and patterns of these behaviors will be recognizable. But as I mentioned earlier, that's okay because we need to identify them first in order to fix them. And no one is a high value person without understanding where they had come from and being able to grow into being a high value person. And no one is a high value person 100% of the time. No. We it's all impossible. slip in certain environments will be triggered, it'll bring up this pattern. So doing the work, being someone who is into self-development, you realize that it's a process, it's not an outcome. So it's not about just listening to this podcast, changing a couple things and then saying, okay, I'm fixed. I'm never gonna be low value again. There are gonna be moments and there's still moments for me where I'm like, wow, that was really low value behavior. I wanna fix that and I wanna think about what evoke that in me? What was that that brought that pattern back out of me? All right. Shall we get it started? Yes. All right. So first, I think we should talk about the mechanism of why it works. Uh, you hinted at it, but I want to put it in very clear terms. All right. Yeah. So uh, as animals, uh, we are a, a certain species of animals. Uh, we are herd animals. So that means that we need attention approval and acceptance from the herd so that on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the first rung is met, which is our safety. Once we feel safe, everything else from there grows. Uh, being able to actualize our full potential and being creative and all this other stuff. But we can't do any of that until our basic needs of safety is met first. In order to feel safe, we need attention, approval, and acceptance. Now, I'm sure there's somebody in this audience right now is going, oh, I don't need any of that. Well, you do because you're a human being. We all crave it. And when, once you understand that, you can use that to your benefit. You can use that to your advantage. All right. So how do we get the attention, approval, and acceptance that we need? Well, how we go about doing that changes. As AJ mentioned, for a lot of people, the first way they learn to get attention from people is to cry when you're a child. That gets you attention. And then you learn from that. And then as a child, you learn that you have this magical power that anytime that you start crying, throwing a tantrum, whatever you need to do, that you are going to get the attention that you desire. And for some of you, you've never left that first <laughs> learned pattern. In fact, we can see it on social media times where people seem to post their new element every day, right? In order to get attention. It may not be the attention that you need or uh, attention that is good for you, but you have to understand that it's attention nonetheless, and that's why it is so powerful. And for some people, bad attention is as good as good attention. In fact, there is a, when it comes to entertainment, there's an old law that still very, very relevant to this day that all publicity is good publicity. So when, we are in a state of crying to get attention as a kid. 
Some of us break it because our parents, maybe they've gone through sleep training. Maybe our parents (laughs) have just grown tired of the tears. will no longer respond to just you crying. So as a child, you are still craving attention. So you will come up with new strategies to get your parents' attention. Sometimes it's doing exceedingly well in sports, in school, with your homework. It's performance driven. And guess what? That'll often carry on into your career. Many of our successful clients are seeking that attention, that approval, and that acceptance through hard work, through grinding it out, through excelling in their career. And then they will come to us and be frustrated that that excelling in my career does not lead to quality relationships in other areas of my life. People don't want to talk about your Ivy League background. People don't really care about just how well you did on that last consulting project. But these are, again, patterns and strategies that are shifting and evolving as we evolve, again, chasing that value from others. All right, so that's attention. So we should move on to the next one, right? The other one is approval. So the mechanisms are the three A's, attention, approval, and acceptance. We define those three things as value. And for low value behaviors, it's how do you get that value that allows you to feel good. That feeling of good is that you're accepted by the herd. So that means that you are safe. That's how it all works. So the next one, we've already talked about acceptance, is going to be approval. Now, approval is about the decisions that you are going to make in life that are going to, one, give you an identity, It is going to put food on the table. It is for you to articulate your worldview in which others are going to be able to connect. All of these things put you in a place where you have to make decisions on how you want to go about it, the path that you choose. Now, having those many forks in the road and all of these decisions, you're looking around at the other folks in the herd going, which one should I take? And they're like, "Uh, take the one you think is best. Now, Some of those choices are going to lead to a lot of approval. Some of those choices are not going to lead to any. In fact, we had just done a wonderful interview with Todd Cashton called The Art of Subordination about choosing the path that is right for you, but may not have the acceptance from everybody else and how hard taking those those lone roads are at times. Now, how you go about getting that approval is just as important as how you go about getting that attention. Mm -hmm. But approval is more than attention. Attention's looking at you, it's listening to you. Approval is when they actually start to appreciate you. They start to pay even more attention to you. They start to agree with you. Now, you can start to see how these, these things build. And when you build a life around chasing this from others, well, that's going to be a lot of work. <laughs> and it's also going to start attracting people who are also chasing it for the right and wrong reasons. Now, acceptance, right? The third level of this is when you actually form those bonds, those connections, those relationships. So obviously we have getting people to give you the thumbs up on Facebook, maybe comment on your Instagram post, get a slam the heart on your TikTok. Yeah, that's a little bit of attention, right? Mixed in with some slight approval. Now we're talking about acceptance. We're talking about inviting you on the boat trip. We're talking about going on the date with you. We're talking about welcoming you to the team, bringing you on board in the ax throwing club. Being invited to the party. That is acceptance. We all crave it. Every single one of us craves it. In fact, that is why you're listening to this podcast here. Johnny and I were laughing earlier. We were talking about some things that we're working on for the podcast content and for the show fans. And we said, listen, we're not here to talk about celebrity gossip. We're not here to talk politics. We're here to talk human dynamics, relationship building skills. So if you're listening to the show, odds are, you're looking for more strategies for acceptance, for building those relationships, those close ties. Now, I want you to understand the power that those three things have. Because 
when you have them, you're included in the herd. And the, the herd, the other thing that you have to be mindful of is that if you go to the front of the herd as the leader of the herd, right? You would think, oh, everyone wants to be the leader. Well, no, that's not the case because the minute you're the leader, other people in the herd will be looking to take you out. There'll be some very driven uh, animals in the herd. They're like, I can do a better job. So you don't wanna get too far up, right? But the other side of that is you don't want to get too far behind because then you get picked off. This mentality, this herd mentality has been with us since the dawn of time of our species. It's who we are at a very innate level. And we have to combat and fight these, these innate tendencies all the time. And so for us, the very basic need is to be somewhere in the middle of that herd uh, with a lot of approval, a lot of acceptance and a lot of attention that we're in the right place. And once we have that, we feel good. Getting too far outside or too far ahead brings on the anxieties of danger because, well, you are putting yourself in danger in those positions. You will be outside the herd. When you're outside the herd, that's where anxiety begins. Absolutely. So what are some strategies that we will develop as patterns to our behavior in a low value way of seeking out those three things from others. And as we go through these, you know, we first started teaching this, we assign numbers to it, but in actuality, all three of them are equal in being low value. And to some people, they'll look slightly different to others. But at the end of the day, there are behaviors and patterns that you don't want to exhibit if you want to surround yourself with high value people. Now, high value people, by definition, are not threatened by you. They live a life of abundance, meaning they are not chasing attention, approval, and acceptance. They don't feel that they're at the head of the herd. They don't feel that they're behind the herd. They feel like they are ready to self-actualize and they would like nothing more than for you to self-actualize. Now, they're few and far between. And I, can, I want to add to that as well, that when you get to that point as a high value person, and we're going to do a special complete episode on that next month, your self-actualization becomes more important to you than the herd. So you're able to use the herd for the support that you need it, but you're also able to accomplish and aspire to your greatness as well. And you're not afraid to leave the herd when there is choices that make that allow you to actualize that full potential. That becomes the most important. So as the high value person is looking to self-actualize, the low value people are just looking to maintain. Which is why we've had such a variety of guests on the show. We've had athletes, we've had mindset coaches of athletes, mindset coaches of elite special operators. Why? Because self-actualization is a high value trait. And if you want to attract amazing people into your life, then self-actualization is the best way to do that. But we have to get above the herd to do that. We have to get above these tendencies to get to that place. Now, if you are in a situation where you are chasing these three things, attention, approval, acceptance, constantly from others, you oftentimes will be exhibiting these low value behavior patterns. You will then be communicating to those who are high value that you're not ready for self-actualization. You're living a life of scarcity and scarcity actually robs anyone else in your life from getting to that next level. It's an anxiety place that does not allow one to self-actualize. So if you're following along, we're gonna go through these three behaviors break down some nonverbal and verbal signals so that you will most likely first start to see them in others. That's completely normal. And that's a cognitive bias. We all view ourselves in a higher regard than we are in reality. And we're able very quickly to recognize patterns in others that we're probably exhibiting in ourselves, which is why in the X Factor Accelerator, we're filming our clients constantly to hold up that mirror, to give you an opportunity to get beyond your cognitive distortions that are keeping you from that self-actualization, that are keeping you from your real potential. So, supplicative is an old word. 
It's an old word. It means to beg. And what have we been talking about this whole time? Value, attention, approval, and acceptance. So it is behaviors that beg for people to like you. And I'm going to give everyone a mission who's listening to this right now. And your mission is to go out to a social event this evening and ask 50 people to please like me. That's what I want you to do. I want you to walk up to 50 people and ask them to please like you. How would you feel? How would that make you feel? Now, for most people, you're probably cringing wherever you are right now. And you should be because that is a very low value behavior. It puts you in a place of needing attention, acceptance, and approval from other people. That is supplicative behavior. Now, we're going to break down a bunch of those behaviors to give you an idea of what you're going to be looking for. And if we come across any behaviors that you exhibit, I want you to be honest with yourself because the more honest you are with yourself listening to this podcast right now, the better you're going to be after this is over. All right. The faster the change is going to happen. Right. We can't change ourselves if we're dishonest about it. So please like me. Let's start with that lens, right? Walking around LA, you see a lot of people who are outside the herd, unfortunately, who've been left behind by society, who are struggling with drug addiction, mental illness. And what are they doing? They're begging for any attention possible in hopes of getting some support, some connection. And we've talked about this on the show in the past. Some of them will stop traffic. They'll get in, remove all chance of their own personal safety just to get attention. So we can see on others that that's probably not a good way to go about getting other people connected to you, getting other people to self-actualize around you and want to support you. But we do this in a lot of nefarious ways that are unconscious, that we don't even realize. The first is the victim narrative where everything in life is conspiring against you. You being at the center of it, your boss is out to get you, your neighbor is screwing with you, that person who cut you off is trying to keep you from getting to work. If you find yourself consistently feeling like you are the victim of someone else's behaviors and actions, you're actually acting in a supplicative manner. You are using that victim mentality and that victim narrative to get other people to pay attention to you, to get other people to support you, to get other people invested in you. Now, it doesn't at the surface seem supplicative, right? It's not like, please, I'm begging you to like me, but playing the victim is actually begging people to support you. And you can draw a direct line to childhood, right? Crying to get attention, approval, and acceptance. As we mentioned, some people never grow out of that first pattern, all right? So there we have the victim mentality. Now, what goes with the victim mentality? We have shrinking, so getting smaller. If you go to a social event and you find yourself up against the wall, immediately pulling out your phone, trying to shrink into the bushes like the, the Homer Simpson meme, meme, you're being supplicative. You're, there's a reason for doing that, and it's not feeling as if you are able to take up, worthy of taking up that space. This is very important. Now, you mo you're not going to logically come to that conscious conclusion, but these are, we're talking about deep seated innate behaviors. Now, <laughs> when we think about being smaller, crossing our arms, hiding, not being visible, closing your body off is also a way to make yourself smaller. You might not physically be smaller in stature, but if, if you're against the wall at an event, if you're trying not to be seen, if you're actually avoiding interaction, you are playing the victim. You are being smaller. You are supplicating, hoping that someone will see you in your small, stricken state and come over and talk to you. Now, another way that we supplicate, another way that we beg other people to like us 
So you're looking to other people to make decisions. So whatever way the wind blows, that's great for you. And in fact, the more decisions other people are making, the better, because you don't have to put yourself out on a limb. Your decisions are not the ones that are going to be scrutinized. You could just bob your head, nod your head and say, this is fine, no matter what's going on around you. Being a people pleaser. People pleaser. Constantly elevating the opinions of others. So maybe you overheard someone say, oh, those shoes are out of style. And immediately you stop wearing them. You lose all conviction. You are unwilling to put your neck out there for fear that you will no longer get the attention. You will no longer be approved of, and you will no longer be accepted in the group. So think about how much have you shape-shifted, chameleoned to be a part of something? Do you find yourself constantly joining different countercultures and, and changing your identity? One minute you're a rock and roller and the next minute you're emo and the next minute you're going out in your athletic gear. If you don't actually have conviction and you're so worried about other people's opinions and approval of you, these people-pleasing tendencies are supplicative. And you know, I was, while well, you're bringing that up, memories going back to when you're a teenager and you're trying to discover who your identity, right? Your own identity outside of your family, right? This is the first time when you see other kids and you're trying to connect with them and you want to, you see certain groups that may aesthetically look interesting to you, or you see the kids who are getting all the attention. So you want to be like one of those kids. So what we see is teenagers putting themselves out on a limb, trying to feel their way into an identity in which they're going to be accepted. That is such an incredibly difficult time for young people, but it is part of the process. And that's why so many of us don't have necessarily fond memories <laughs> of those high school, middle school moments of trying to figure out that identity and figure out which herd you are a part of, truly. The last one I want to bring up is agreeableness. And it is part of the ocean psychology test, temperament test. And we use it as an intake form for our program. So there's certain patterns that a lot of our, our clients tend to, to fall into. It's a great test just to look at personalities. And agreeableness and being high on agreeable is it, it's either really high with agreeableness or really low on agreeableness. So either rigid or you say yes to everything because it's the easy answer. And people pleasers tend to say yes to everything. And I, and I want to make a special note here as well. There's nothing wrong with being overly agreeable. It's only when you put everyone else's needs before your own. This is much like, you, you, I've heard you use this analogy of, being on an airplane and putting your mask on before you put on, uh, you're they're helping your passengers. Yeah. It's this need to check in with everyone while you're out. How you doing? You liking the music? How's the beverage? Is it okay is the, for you? <laughs> is the food okay? What about the temperature? You know, it's this constant outward attention on other people's comfort, other people's needs. And in fact, many times, and I, I've struggled with this myself, you then get to a point where you can't even articulate your own needs because you're so tuned in to the needs of others. And this was a big part of my childhood, the way that I was raised, that my dad's needs were on a pedestal. They were the most important. And I remember watching the, I believe it was a Chris Rock uh, special where dad always got the chicken leg, you know, same thing in my house. And it was like, everyone was happy when dad's needs were met because dad worked his tail off in a blue collar job to put food on the table. So we were all managing his needs first. And in, in turn, that quieted my needs, pushed my needs to the side, my emotions I was less in tune of. Now, of course, at first, being supplicative is a way to get your foot in the door. Sure. Right? Who doesn't like an agreeable person? Who doesn't <laughs> like someone who's going to foot the bill? Who's going to be the one to cover the Uber ride? Who's going to be the one to always text first and always respond? Right? But that robs you of effort, energy to meet your own needs, to put that oxygen mask on first, to get to a level of self-actualization. So we've done a bunch of behaviors there 
for supplicative. I also want to make sure that we throw in a few nonverbals. Yeah. Because everyone's like, oh, I don't do any of that. I don't do any of that. I want, I want to throw in a few nonverbals because those are always the trickiest. And then we'll go on to the next one. How's that sound? Let's so do it. the most important nonverbal, I think, that cannot be understated in this, and we see it all the time, and it's why we do video work, is too much positive body language. Now, on this podcast, it's going to be a little bit difficult uh, for us to go through this, but this is going to be on YouTube as well. So the first, the front half of me is positive body language. If I was shoulder to shoulder with AJ, then we would be neutral to each other. And then if I turned my back to AJ, that is negative body language. Agreeable people who are looking for attention, approval, and acceptance tend to go full positive to everyone they speak to, to such a high degree that it puts too much pressure on the person that they're speaking to. This makes the other person feel, uh, have some anxiety get on them. They're feeling tension and pressure in order to perform and entertain this person they're speaking to. And so for them, it will be easier to opt out of this conversation than to stay in it. So imagine you're Iron Man with that, <laughs> that magical nuclear power driven heart. And that beam coming from your chest is just shining directly on the other person nonstop. It's a lot. And at first, it sounds, well, why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I want to give the other person attention? Sure. Why wouldn't I want to show them that I'm interested in them? Why wouldn't I want them to know that I'm listening? But as Johnny said, we again are putting all of our focus on the other person. We're shining this beam straight from our chest at the other person. And all it does is actually repel the other person. It makes them uncomfortable. It's too much of a need to please the other person non verbally. So we talked about shrinking, making yourself smaller. We've talked about fully facing someone. The other one that we see a lot of on our video work in X Factor Accelerator is avoidance of eye contact. <laughs> so you'll find yourself unable to look people in the eye for fear of judgment, for fear of being found out, or maybe just general discomfort. But Again, what that is signifying, not only a lack of confidence, but it's signifying that your needs are not that important. It doesn't matter where you're looking. Like, you're just happy to be there. You know, it's, it's making yourself small in nonverbal ways that send a signal of a lack of confidence and actually elevates the status of everyone around you to your own detriment. I think the last one I just want to throw in there is when you're in, in the context of this communication, when you're speaking to somebody that you're interested in or you want approval of or that you like, the other part is we have the full positive body language and uh, then we have the eye contact going on. But for the person who is putting the low value person who is giving them all the attention, who is giving them all the positive body language, it makes it hard for them to then be at their best verbally because they're giving them all their attention. The attention and pressure is feeling between the two people. And on top of that, to get away from that tension and pressure, they tend to self-soothe. So they'll close off and they'll, be, they'll become insular. Right. They'll, you'll cross your arms and rub yourself Touching yourself is self-soothing. Grabbing your phone and putting your phone in front of you to block you. Clutching drinks into your chest. Right. Was Holding a big your, one. your drink close to you, close to your heart even. So another one that I want to point out, and um, we have one client who we, we've called him out a couple times on this, and he, he didn't realize it. But again, he was in such a, a strong state of being supplicative around everyone, just wanting them to like him. You actually, your vocal tonality changes, and it ends everything on an upward trajectory. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening is you, you almost sound like you're asking a question of the other person. You sound unsure of yourself. You're lacking again in conviction and confidence in what you're saying. And in that, you're basically allowing the other person's opinions, views, values, needs, wants to hold the power in any conversation. So paying attention to your behavior patterns in the way that you speak, your tonality, the way that you carry your body, and 
how you are going about getting this attention, approval, and acceptance from others by begging for it is one low-value behavior pattern that we want to avoid, especially when building relationships with people, seeking high-value people in our life. All right. Second one. Now, this is going to feel almost like a complete 180 from supplicative. And a lot of aspects are, but we don't want to get in this binary idea that it's the opposite of the other because they're both equally as bad. Right. And that's why we stop numbering them because when you add numbers, it leads to a gradation that's just not really relevant. Now, the second is combative, right? So instead of begging for that attention, that approval, that acceptance, now you're going to argue your way to it. You're going to just take it. You're going to take it through intimidation. Yeah. By putting the other person down, by physical force, by refusing to bend, by making the other person feel supplicative is smaller, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of coming in lesser than, it's coming in over the top more than. And here's the thing about this. You learn this at an early age when you perhaps maybe you're a little bit bigger than the other kids on the block, or maybe you're a little bit uh, more athletic than some of the kids on the block. Or sometimes just out yelling your mom right. gets her to stop, yeah. right? So, so now these behaviors, you recognize that the louder, the more intimidating, uh, the more you want to enter into conflict, you begin to realize that most people will avoid all of those interactions. So you will get what you want due to being intimidating. And again, for some people, they never grow out of it. So now you're seeing this in full display in, in our world today. And it comes in the form of stepping into people's personal space, putting others down, being argumentative just for the sake of being argumentative because people begin to realize that dealing with you is a lot of trouble. It's a big hassle. So they just opt out of it. You're thinking, oh, I've become dominant. You're not dominant. You just People just don't want to deal with you. Right. It's, it's having a short <laughs> fuse. It's ending everything louder, larger, more commanding than necessary. These people are very easy to see, much like supplicative folks, because as soon as they get in a in an uncomfortable situation, their go-to is to inflate, to get bigger, to get louder, to, to become- Get in your space. Get in your space, become argumentative. I mean, the, the perfect example is the internet meme, the Karen, <laughs> right? That's an, an example that I think all of us have laughed at over the years, where it's just like, they don't back down, they argue for the sake of arguing, and of course- they're getting attention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're getting a lot of attention. You'll Everyone will stop and look at a Karen. Everyone will stop and go, well, who's yelling? What's going on here? What's all this commotion? Also, the internet is very easy to see these people because they don't have to, we were just talking about this, they don't have to interact with people in the world world. So therefore, there is no compromise. So their, their avatar is this big bully on the internet. This is just the way it is. And it's nothing else. And if you don't see it my way, then I'm just going to block you. And so they have built this world around them that perpetuates this combative attitude. Then when you're in the world world, Right. We have to compromise. There are There is communication and interactions that are going on verbally and non-verbally that allows us all to get along. And the better our skills are uh, in acknowledging that, the easier it is for us to maneuver in the world. If we're rigid in those skills, you are going to be met with obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. Why make this hard on yourself? The reason it's difficult for combative people to understand that is for them, for a lot of them, as long as I'm not getting walked over, I'm the walkie. As long as I'm not getting run over, then I'm the walker. I'm doing the, I'm walking on other people. And so they have taken an identity in being that person. Anything else would mean that they would have to compromise or step down. It's a direct attack on this identity. And I would even say for some combative people, it's hard for them to shake 
out of that value because it is so ingrained in them and they're so insecure about being seen in any other way. And I will say for the nice guy who swings the pendulum completely to the other side, well, I'm not going to get walked all over anymore. Those tend to be the ones who get stuck there. Yeah. We talked about the victimhood pattern was supplicative. Now we have black and white thinking with combative. It's a cognitive distortion that's run amok. So <laughs> you have on supplicative side, the world is conspiring against me. On the combative side, you got to take everything in this world. There is everything has to be taken and you take it by force. Now, as you can imagine, someone who's high value, someone who doesn't view conflict as a net positive will do and deal with conflict as it arises because it's a part of human nature. Yep. So they're not going to avoid it, but they're certainly not looking for it versus a combative person looking for conflict. So as Johnny said, let, let's highlight some of these nonverbal signals, right? So we have posturing. Yes. We have making yourself larger, taking up more physical space, and in the process, actually getting in others' personal space. They almost seem like they're inflating. <laughs> yeah. Well, they usually are full of hot air. They're full of hot air, that's for sure. They will make just copious amounts of eye contact. So we have supplicative who's like looking around constantly, like trying to figure out, is this okay? Am I okay? They are piercing, piercing. eye contact. They want to see you look away. They want to see you blink. And I would say there's some of this is some some old macho stuff that just doesn't pay off in our world today. And, and I don't and I think they're just gentlemen tells rather than old wives tells or gentlemen tells, which is when you shake a, a guy's hand, make sure you squeeze it tight to let him know that you're you mean business. You're the boss. You're yeah. the boss. Uh, and when you make sure you look him in the eyes so he knows who you are, a great handshake and great eye contact go a long way. But again, with interaction, it's not one thing or the other. It, there, is a, there is a gray area where you want to hit, where it shows, yeah, I am confident. And I bet you're awesome too. So we're going to be awesome together. Now, combative, of course, it's easy to see how it repels, right? right. Supplicative, when you actually stop to think about it, yeah, okay, it is repelling, especially repeatedly. Combative, we all can agree is repelling. Let's talk about the third low value behavior pattern. This one is an interesting one. We see it in a lot of clients because it does accomplish one of Maslow's basic needs. Yes. Putting food on the table. Yes, it does. In a world of survival, being competitive, being a winner, in a winner take all environment or mindset, that is going to get you paid. That is going to get you options in your dating life. That is going to make you feel like you're coming out ahead. And what I'm about to say is going to piss off some of you all because you spent your life in this mode, and we call this competitive. And immediately, there's already people thinking, and I thought this as well, what is wrong with being competitive? And I'll tell you, there's nothing wrong with being competitive. Good, healthy competition makes the world and you better. We uh, like sports. Yeah. <laughs> we like capitalism. We understand that competition, healthy competition, has a great place in the world. But when it comes to relationships, and when it comes to getting attention, approval, and acceptance from others, competing for it, is actually low value. And it pushes others away. And we'll get to those moments. What I also want to add to that is, again, this stems from early childhood. And so if you get a lot of attention, uh, let's just say you were talking about grades, right? Perhaps you were out competing your classmates in grades and you got a lot of attention for that. For some people, they grew up in an athletic focus household where they were Medals Actually, and the, trophies the, the, and right, all, the all accoutrements the wall, that they, go with that. And, and, and that allows them to feel good. The issue and where this gets you in trouble, like anything else, is when you start to look at everything at, as a competition. It's either I win or I've lost. And we talk about this all the time. If you have that sort of mentality in sales, you're going to get crushed because sales isn't linear. You're going to you, you put out the good vibes. You, you let them know how you can solve their, their problem. Uh, you're having a good time. And then when they're ready, they're going to make that, that buy. 
But if you, it's either, you're either signing on this or you're out of my life forever. And don't you ever call me again? Copies for closers, <laughs> right? <laughs> Competitive, <laughs> right? We play this video clip for effect inside of our live training in the X Factor because it does such a great job of showcasing the competitiveness in Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, that famous sales movie. All the values that we're discussing are represented very well in that movie. But the caveat there is that you were watching a perspective that the director wants you to see it in. He's framing these behaviors and actions in a certain way for a certain effect. That's called movie magic, but we'll leave it at that. Check now, out the movie, watch the behaviors. Now. We had victimhood, yes. supplicative. We had take it, black and white thinking, combative. Competitive is the one upper. Yes, yeah, so I wanna give three verbals for each one, or well, a verbal for each one. Supplicative, please like me. Combative, you suck. Competitive, better than you. Whoa. Think about that, right? All three of those things. If we were to tell you right now today, Johnny and I are hanging out in Vegas, yep. hit the boulevard, hit the strip, tell 50 people, please like me. So how gonna, far are you getting? Not going very far. No. I, in actuality, here in Vegas or any big city, there'll be some people who might find that quite interesting. <laughs> and you wouldn't last 50. <laughs> and, now, yeah. go up to 50 people in the casino. You suck. Yeah, how's Doubt that? you're getting past five or six. No. Go up to 50 people as they're winning at the blackjack table. Better than you. Better than you. Also, not collecting very many winnings. Now, for some of you who are still not getting it and still trying to think, oh, listen, man, I've been competing my whole life and this is this is the deal. This is, this is where it gets you the, the farthest. I'm going to break it down for you because you are exerting energy and time and effort for nothing. And it's all it's doing is putting hurdles in front of you. So think about the term we put there, better than you. So that means that in every interaction, you have to demonstrate how you're better than the person you're speaking to. That is awesome. exhausting. And how does that come up? Well, it comes in the form of telling a better story than the guy that just told a story. Um, showing the nicer watch, show. talking about the better house, the faster car, the more expensive shoes, the cooler honeymoon. I mean, it comes out in so many ways. And once you install this lens and you see it, and you see how many people around you are seeking value through competition, it rubs you the wrong way. Why? Because it's scarcity. It means someone has to win, therefore, ergo, someone's Somebody losing. Has. And if you're around, you're either getting in competition, and, and if you're not, then you are the loser end. And if you are, you have to outwork and compete the, the person who put you in the competition. Right, so you feel like a winner. Is that person who feels like a loser at the end of that conversation <laughs> going to want to spend more time with you? No. No. So when you're living in scarcity, which we talk about that frame, this is what we mean practically. You are looking for ways. And many of us, myself included, I've, I've been there. You're listening to a story and you're hearing something and you're like, well, I did that better. I stayed at a cooler resort. Yeah. I, I did a uh, much better result on that exam. I got a higher score on my SAT. I went to a better school. It happens. Why? Because Modern society capitalism is built on competition. It's woven in to how we're putting food on the table. And of course, in sports, it's great. Absolutely. Building we, relationships, not so great. And, you know, we had Mira Kirschenbaum on this show. And it was interesting because one of her points about relationships is power plays. And, and those, fairness. And fairness. And those power plays are competition. It's letting the other person know that you are lesser than they are. Now, healthy relationships do not work in that manner. They do not. So what does a competitor do? What is the constant competition? Always points out where they got one over on you, where they did it better. Every story, you, you're itching to share a moment where you can shine. You have to be in the spotlight and seen as the winner. Another one that I want to bring up 
Think about the times that you maybe have been out with friends and you were in a conversation. And maybe there was a few of you chatting up a, a few girls that you had been interested in. And one of the guys is just cutting everybody off, just trying to soak up the spotlight and or sees an opportunity to put you and your mates down in order to make himself look better. And now all of a sudden, I bet everyone's going, I know that guy. <laughs> or even worse, or, I, I am, am that, that guy. guy. <laughs> But it doesn't work, ultimately. It might work in that moment. Right. It, it might make you feel good in the short term. But that's a lot of what we're talking about here. All these behaviors in the short term, they give you that dopamine. They give you that little hit of serotonin and make you feel good in the moment. But over the long term, these behaviors are to the detriment of healthy relationships. And they repel high-value people. So whether you're begging for it, whether you're combating people for it and beating them up, physically, verbally over it, or you're just one-upping them, the other person doesn't feel so great around you and therefore is probably not going to want to spend more time with you. And if they're high value and they're seeking self-actualization, they're not interested in victimhood, they're not interested in fighting, and they're not interested in competing in every facet of life. And I want to just go touch on what we were talking about earlier as we wrap this up which is you can sit on the couch and you can listen to this and go, oh, I'm so glad that I don't do any of those behaviors. We're not talking about what you're doing right now, why you're on the couch and why you're comfortable. It's how you operate when you are not on the couch, when you're not comfortable, when you are under tension and pressure. Because high value people are able to escape those three behaviors and become high value in those moments. And when we come back next month, that is what we're gonna tell you how to do.